hello everybody. Um, I'm actually quite excited to be here. I have to stand because I'm a bit jumpy, so I have to stand close to the laptop because apparently there's some video screen uh, next room. So um, I'm very glad that everybody voted for my talk and actually you all came up here. And I'm pretty sure it has nothing to do that, uh, with the fact that there's the word beer in the title. So um, I'm going to present some work. So this is usually how we start talks in physics, which I've done uh, with a colleague of mine called Nick Luthi. And so we are both PhD students at the Center for Quantum Technologies, which is uh, hosted at the National University here. And um, <coughs> In our day jobs, we actually build a lot of electronics, uh, build lasers, shine them at atoms, and try to understand the quantum world and put them somehow to use for future technologies. But don't worry, I won't actually talk to you about any of this, this physics stuff. Instead, it turns out physicists are a very uh, sociable bunch, and we have all a, a common hobby at our institute, and that's basically drink a good beer with good friends. Now, um, Nick is unfortunately not here today because he actually heated his own advice and went to KL to a beer fest, so he's probably enjoying himself very much right now. Instead, uh, I have the pleasure to talk to you about in the next uh, 30 minutes uh, about uh, how we, how and why we brew our own beer. So this is going to be a tech talk, so I'm, I replaced the thing by make good beer, and of course stay with good friends. Um, and I thought initially this is more of a software crowd, so I, I, walk you through, I will walk you through very simple examples. But then I uh, watch Bunny Hunk's talks just now, and so I'm, I'm no longer sure about the uh, software crowd part. So if this is somehow below your expectations, uh, bear with me. Anyway, so what is this talk going to be about? Um, we're basically, uh, at first, I have to convince you that beer is not Tiger. Don't get me wrong, I actually like Tiger beer, but, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but there's much more to beer than commercially available beers. And the whole uh, talk will basically um, uh, center around this, this um, duality between home brewing, so people who actually brew home uh, the beer at home, so it's not the home brew thing that you have on your Mac, um, and the making people. So uh, it's, it's basically people that tinker uh, with electronics and, and build hardware. So I'm going to show off uh, mainly hardware hacks. So I even to, to get some street cred, I even brought old equipment. So you can see that this is all real. And I also uh, got inspired and will talk about our software hack. So you will even uh, hear something like web sockets in this talk, although it has to do with, with beer. OK, um, beer is not Tiger. What do I mean by this? So this is not, again, to just uh, put Tiger down. It's a perfectly valid drink if you're out with friends and you're thirsty. However, no matter where you go in the world, there's always commercially available beer. In Germany, there are certain brands that are easy to buy. In the UK, there are certain beers that are easy to buy. And in, in Singapore, it just happens to be Tiger. Now, all these beers tend to taste alike. And it might not be your preferred taste, and it's a very industrial process. So the beer is made to last long. The beer is made to appeal to the most kind of people. The, the, the um, beer is made to be uh, produced very cheaply. So in other words, it might not be the best beer that you ever had in your life. Now, there are many, many other um, uh, styles of beer. And I, I, I only put this slide up to con uh, confuse you. So somebody, uh, um, because I'm a scientist, but so somebody actually tried to put madness into the whole, uh, um, you know, reason into the whole madness. And they um, compiled the periodic table of beer styles. Now, um, you might have drunk a lot of them. German Pilsner, one of my favorite, for example, or uh, Imperial Stout, uh, Nick's, one of Nick's favorites. But um, I'm pretty sure after 10 seconds, you'll find uh, styles which you have never drank, drunk in your life. How about an ice pop? Anybody here? No? It's a very speciality beer from Germany. It's actually quite nice. Um, so, and if you want to explore this somehow, you have two options. So your first option is you could drink imported craft beers. So people actually import a lot of, um, not every beer in the world, but a lot of beers in Singapore. And there are places where you can buy it, and there are pubs specialized in what they call craft beers, like in craftsmanship versus in bad industrial beers. Or you can go to local microbreweries. So there's uh, Red Dot, there's Brewworks, and um, Paulana beer locally brews, brews the beer and makes one of the best German beer uh, by any standard. And um, so if you're just in interested into the drinking part, you don't you know, have to go to Geek Camp and learn about how to make your own beer. You can just drink it. <laughs> However, that's half the fun. So uh, your second option is to just make it yourself. Uh, first of all, I mean, I skipped one point here. So we were students, so we thought it might be cheaper. It's still a bit cheaper, but uh, you can still sink an enormous amount of time and energy into this process. 
However, you get the full control over the flavor. So you can uh, play with all the ingredients, you can make even crazy beers, and uh, you basically get to taste new stuff. Sometimes that's uh, also a disadvantage, because if you screw up your beer, it tastes really horrible. And the best part about this uh, hobby, which we didn't foresee at all, it keeps you hacking at weekends. So it's the ideal thing. So you just ah, let me just try this, or let me just improve that. And so you have always something to do. And um, so and that is a, a basic message I'm trying to convey to you uh, in this talk. OK, so the beer basics. Um, so maybe you have guessed I'm not Veronica. I come from Germany. And uh, there's this purity law that uh, says water, barley, and hops make beer. So nothing else is allowed. Back then, they didn't figure out that you need yeast. They were just using white yeast uh, that just came into the beer. However, these are the main four ingredients. So water, it's pretty clear why you need it. It's a drink, so you need somehow some liquid. So water is a good starting point. Uh, barley is the grains. And uh, grains are full of starch, which is an energy source. And in the first step, the starch is going to be uh, transferred into sugar. And um, then you boil it with hops, which gives you the um, distinctive beer flavor, so this slight bitterness. It's also a preservative, so in the Middle Ages, you could store beer much longer than you could store water. Uh, and then you add yeast, which turns the sugar into alcohol. And at the end, you end up with this alcoholic, hopsy, barley drink, which we all call beer. All right, I stole a nicer looking um, uh, info chart from, from the internet. So a typical brew, to give you an idea, would start, it's a biological process. So it's not like coding, uh, where your keyboard can be very dirty. So you have to be very clean, because there are yeast involved, there are enzymes involved. And then you have the first step, um, which is called the mushing, where you have the grains. And you put them at a specific temperature, where enzymes in the grains convert the starch into the sugar. Now you have a watery, sugary solution. You boil that, that both sanitize, sanitizes the beer and um, it adds this uh, particular flavor of hops, and depending on different hops, you get different flavors. So you can uh, engineer uh, your taste to a large degree. Then you cool it down, and um, you put it into some other container, put in the yeast. The yeast does it work, slowly eats the sugar, and um, digests it as alcohol. Um, and after a week or two, you have to bottle it and just drink it up. OK, so this is all I'm going to tell you about how, how you make beer. There's actually a whole science behind this. So, um, if you, but if you Google home brewing, there are like uh, almost like a Wikipedia on home brewing out there. They can find everything. Okay, so recap: a couple of steps. Mashing, we convert the starch into sugar. How do we do that? We have grains. We want to keep the grains at the target temperature, which is typically hot, so it's 65 degrees, or uh, warm. And um, then we uh, add boil, we boil it to add hops and flavor. And um, then we cool it down, which as such is actually uh, not that easy, if you think about it. Um, uh, the next step is the fermenting, where we convert the sugar into alcohol. Uh, and we, I call this the pre-beer. This is not the official term. But where you basically have the pre-beer, you have to keep it at the target temperature, which is typically cold, where the yeast likes to work and, and, and produce this, this uh, um, alcohol. And then you have to put it into kegs and drink it. So why am I a peak camp and not in a pub? It's because we basically hack certain steps. So we've hacked the mashing, we've hacked the fermenting, and we even have hacked the kegging part of things. And um, so I'm going to present uh, these, these steps and how we, how we sort of hack them on the way. So I'm going to present solely our own projects. Um, but there in Singapore, there's by now a large um, community. So there are way more projects than I could fit in half an hour. And um, I also. Uh, um, We'll mainly focus on half hardware, mainly because we are very bad at writing software. <laughs> Physicists and not software engineers. I'm going to um, present four things. First is the recirculating mush tun, which is basically the mushing step, as you can um, guess from the name. Then I will tell you about the fermentation uh, chest freezer, which is for fermentation. And last, last the hardware project will be the kegerator. Uh, and uh, last but not least, I couldn't help by putting in the fluffy boo software, as you will see at the, at the end. Okay, so the recirculating mush tun. This project is all about getting the mush right. So here you see grains in water, and uh, you see some water flying around. You see a Kopitiam style heater, so that can somehow heat the water. And uh, now all you have to do is keep that water and the grains at the constant temperature and make sure that the enzymes do their work and convert starch into sugar. Uh, enzymes work at a specific temperature, depending on which grain you use. Um, 
and you typically have to keep all the grain homogeneously at that temperature, which means you have to circulate the water, otherwise the water closer to the heater would be warmer than the water somewhere else. And um, if you have um, speciality grains, you might even have to have different steps, say uh, 30 minutes at this temperature and 15 minutes at this temperature, to give different grains, uh, not grains, enzymes a chance to work. And your whole goal is to maximize starch to sugar conversion and uh, give, as a side effect, um, give the um, beer a nice um, grainy body. So it's also a, a little bit for the, um, for the taste. But uh, the more sugar you have, the more alcohol you have. So. OK. Um, so uh, this is basically the basic idea again. So we really went down and bought a Kupitian style heater, and we just uh, modified it slightly. And um, so um, what we did is you go down to Chinatown, to Temple Street. You buy a, a, a heater, which is about this tall. And it's really uh, kept for uh, used for keeping soup warm, or um, like coffee or something. And then we added a pump, an aquarium pump, to recirculate the water. And uh, you also want to have control over the heater. So the, these, these heaters, you can typically just turn them on manually. And you want to somehow have a bit of a finer grain control. And I'll, I'll walk you through the control. And again, I, I apologize a bit. If, you, if you're a hardware-inclined person, you'll probably find that a bit uh, easy. OK, so this is the black box, which hides all the nasty wiring we have done, um, which probably wouldn't uh, pass much of a safety regulation. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so, so it's still the heater, but you see it's some additional wiring. Uh, and here's the pump. And this is the control software. And somewhere comes the mains. So you've got to be a bit careful. And there are a lot of wires out okay. there. Now, um, if you want to stabilize the temperature, you need to somehow know what's the temperature. We use a thermistor to sense the temperature. And then you want to act back on the temperature in order to stabilize it. So this can be done by turning the heater on and off. So if it's too hot, turn it off. If it's too cold, turn it on. And um, we also want to have control over the pump. And these are actually similar problems. So you can just switch the power either to the pump or to the heater by a relay. So now, full disclaimer, if you try that at home, you're actually switching mains. So you could, in principle, hurt yourself. So you got to be a bit careful. But it's a very well-defined task somehow. And it does, so it's not nothing crazily dangerous. And you want to have some control. And we started out with the Arduino, simply because it's a quite nice, readily available um, platform for doing so. And now the equivalent to, to showing uh, software code is to show uh, circuit diagrams. So I'm going to show two circuit diagrams. Um, the first is how a thermistor works. So a thermistor is a resistor that uh, changes temperature with, uh, that changes resistance with temperature very fast. And so the Arduino would supply 5 volts on the top of this uh, resistive divider. And um, then it would sense, at this point, the, uh, the voltage. And you have a reference resistor, which doesn't change resistance. And this semester, which changes resistance and temperature. So you have a classic voltage divider. At this point, uh, the voltage here will divide it depend on the ratio of these two things. So then the Arduino reads in this voltage, looks up uh, the corresponding temperature, and knows what temperature it is. OK, so we opted for this analog insert input circuit, which is a resistive divider. But if you're not inclined with analog stuff, there are serial chips, which are slightly more expensive. But you could basically use like I squared C kind of thing. So it's a bit of an overkill. But if you don't want to touch in soldering iron, you can probably use them. OK, so then the second uh, circuit diagram I'm going to show is a relay. And it gets more evolved. You see, I put in a protection dial. But so what is a relay? A relay is a coil. And if a uh, current flows through this coil, there's a magnetic field. And the magnetic field will uh, attract this lever. And the lever basically will close this contact. Now, if you put in your um, power supply here and your device there, and of course, somehow the device goes to ground, then you can uh, basically switch the power on and off of the device. And this can be mains. So you can buy relays, which are, are good to switch mains, and they're not that expensive. Now, typically, you don't want to uh, drive the relay directly. I indicated this by at least putting in a protection dial. Um, a, you need quite a large current, which typically the Arduino can't supply. And B, it's an inductive load, so you might actually kill your Arduino. Instead, um, you put in a transistor here, put in a MOSFET. And um, if the Arduino provides a high signal on this uh, uh, transistor, the transistor is open, current can flow, and the, the switch is closed. 
if the uh, digital pin is low, this transistor is open, no current flows, and the, uh, the power is open. So this is, this is all the magic. And um, uh, we have a prototype board, uh, which you can have a look later. But basically, you see uh, the relays. And on these pins, you would connect the mains or the power supply. And here, I mean, it, it's, it's heavily in use. So <laughs> actually, um, I think at some point it broke. But uh, you would slot in an Arduino, and it would basically just control these relays, and that's it. And then at some other point, you would wire in your thermistor. OK, so um, we opted for off-the-shelf uh, electronics. So these things you, you can just buy down at Simlin. Um, and we, at work, we have a prototype uh, milling machine for PCBs. So if you don't have that, you can also buy a, what's called an Arduino shield, where you can um, switch uh, power to devices. But typically, you should be uh, make sure that you are allowed to switch mains. Otherwise, you might actually hurt yourself. All right. Uh, so how do we set temperature stabilize then? Also, we read in the analog voltage. We look at the temperature, and then we adjust the duty cycle. And what I mean by this is summarized in the slide. Um, so the Arduino switches on the relay on for a given amount of time, every period. So if you want to have it cold, the Arduino switches it on for a short amount of time. Then mainly it's off. If you want to have it slightly warmer, the Arduino switches it on longer, and then cold again. And if you want to have hot, it's basically all the time on, more or less. And so you can act back on this duty cycle, which some people would call like a bang bang controller, which sounds nice. And then you 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 can uh, stabilize the um, temperature this way. So who's in charge? So quick show of hands, who has an Arduino at home? Ooh, ooh, hardware crowd. Yes, some people. So of course, we uh, use the Arduino. I mean, at work, we have various kinds of chips, but they're all a bit like typically better than the Arduino, but they're all a bit pain in the ass to, um, to program. So we instead opted for the Arduino, which is perfect for this task. And what makes it even easier is you get all these libraries. So there's a PID library which is basically for closed loop control, where you read in the temperature and you act back on the duty cycle. And if you're familiar with uh, control theory, it's quite easy to use. Uh, we implemented a very ser simple serial communication where you can basically ask the Arduino, oh, what's the temperature? And the Arduino sends back the temperature. Or you can say, Arduino, turn on the pump, and the Arduino turns on the pump. And it's all based on readily available libraries. And then, um, so now you have an Arduino, and you can talk to it. But you need some sort of GUI. And uh, here's the first disclaimer. We all uh, like Nick and I are uh, uh, physicists, so we built the, the easiest thing we could, which is a Python GUI based on the scientific Python stack, which looks A, ugly, and B, is really hard to get going if you don't have like a kitchen sink into the Python distribution. But anyway, what you, the, all the elements that are there, so you can set the, the temperature set point, and then you can say, okay, turn on the PID, turn the pump on. And then it reads off the, the temperature. Here, that's just noise, more or less. But it would go up and down as you, as you vary the thing. And, and basically, you, uh, you can control it. So now all of you in the audience, or most of you in the audience, are probably software guys. So you're like, really? Is that the best thing you could get up with? And we, we actually thought the same. It's probably not cool enough. So a, a few months, actually, after we finished this project, uh, the Raspberry Pi came around, so we thought, okay, we gotta have to we have to be able to control our brewery with the Raspberry Pi. So, who owns a Raspberry Pi? Uh, so that's that's even more, okay. And um, so we, our first thought was, surely somebody must have done it, and um, actually somebody has done it. So basically, in our uh, uh, setup, the Raspberry Pi talks to the Arduino, and uh, simultaneously is hooked up to our wireless at home and serves a web application which we stole, by well, now these days it's called Forked on GitHub by Stephen Smith. So it's called Raspberry Brew. And, um, and basically, it's just a, a, a web GUI that does essentially the same. And we had to just make sure it talks to a, via our serial protocol. And uh, after we've dabbled around with that, uh, um, we started our own project, which we call Flappy Brew. And I'll, I'll uh, talk to you about it quickly if I have time at the end. OK, so this is how the web control looks. Uh, pretty sneak. Uh, looking, it's I think jQuery, but uh, so basically somebody else did it. But now we can control it from any laptop anytime we we actually want. Okay, if you think this is still not cool enough, um, you're probably still right. So be my guest. So now you have a software problem, and I mean if you Google uh, brewery hacks, you like amazed what people think time into just making snazzy looking software. So uh, we are kind of happy now. Um, but if if you're inclined to to uh, 
you know, carry on the torch, feel free, be, be my or be our guest. All right, so to recap, getting the mesh right is having an Arduino-controlled heater, and of course, in order to be cool, having a Raspberry Pi-based web application to control that. Now, uh, the next project is uh, what we call the fermentation chest freezer, and that is um, in order to get the fermentation right. So this is basically how it looks. We have these containers, which uh, are plastic containers, which are sealed, and um, inside there is the pre-beer, and the yeast, so the yeast will slowly eat the sugar, and um, so it's all in some sort of controlled environment. Why is that? Well, ales, so English style beers, ferment typically at 21 degrees. Uh, lagers ferment at 7 degrees, and Singapore, unfortunately, is very hot. <laughs> so, so uh, and if you don't um, supply the right temperature to the yeast while it's working, depending on which yeast, the yeast either dies if it's mass vastly off, so at 35 degrees, some yeast actually die or they produce what we call off flavor, so your beer tastes very bad after that. So you don't want to have that. So instead, you put it into a chest freezer, which is a controlled environment, and you close the lid and then let it there for a week. Now, you don't want to freeze your beer. So again, you want to have a 7 degrees, say, for German side beer, so 20 degrees. Uh, but you just put it in a chest freezer, so you somehow have to control the pet chest freezer. So you, you see there's a pattern. We have another box, um, same box from Simlin. And uh, a couple of, uh, it's another, we like it because they're all black boxes. But in, in principle, this, this thing is, is, is the wire for the thermistor, which goes into the chest freezer. And then here, we switch the mains of the chest freezer. And this is our second iteration. So you can see we, we bought a, a proper plug and a socket. And it, it, it all looks much safer. But if you open up this box, it's essentially as unsafe as anything. Like this. OK, um, uh, okay, so then. Uh, uh, it's a very similar problem to the mush tun. So you uh, read in the temperature, you control it. Uh, you have to cool instead of heat, so you need typically a fridge or a freezer, a second-hand one. And you have to make sure you don't kill your compressors. So um, a fridge is, has a compressor to cool, so you, you can only cool for so long, otherwise you have to turn off your compressor uh, so that it doesn't overheat. You have to wait before it restarts, uh, otherwise the, the fluids in the compressor don't really settle and we kill it. And we also have a simpler logic. But I skipped the details. Um, well, what's more, you don't want to have a com computer dedicated to just watching the temperature for a week, because then you can't watch movies or whatever. So uh, we, we hacked the laser driver, which is um, something we used to control lasers. We added a few buttons and uh, an LCD screen. And we actually made it speak Singlish with the help of our local colleagues. So if you read carefully, it tells you it's cool enough already. And it sometimes tells you cannot cool and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And um, okay. So, so yeah. That's uh, and I brought an old one uh, here, so you can have a look at it. It's again very simple electronics, and that's our prototype. So there's a lot of tape involved, and but yeah, you get the idea. And in in in, in the center there's a Arduino which stacks on top of it. All right. Uh, so much for uh, this. If that's not cool enough for you, you're probably completely right. Uh, so get, get another Raspberry Pi program something. You again have a software problem. Uh, somebody thought, like, why don't you get an, uh, a tablet? And then it turns out tablets are quite expensive. So they're like, no, we probably don't want to do that. But it would look very snazzy. So there are actually people who have the same thing, but they control it via a tablet. And they put it on a web. And we are all like, yeah, if you had some spare money, you would probably do that as well. OK, um, so the good fermentation is an Arduino controlled fridge or freezer. So I'll, I'll quickly go to the last uh, hardware thing. Uh, it's a kegerator. So the kegerator is a mix between a keg and a refrigerator. So it's a, it's a very, very cool thing. And our old, uh, so, oh no, OK, so why do we need that? OK, so you have, a, you have a luxury problem. You have lots of beer. And the last thing is you don't want to bottle it into very tiny bottles, because that's a manual process and just takes too much time. So the solution is, oh yeah, let's buy second-hand kegs. So you get 20 liter kegs on the open market, and now you can put your essentially all your beer into one keg. All right, that's good. You solve your problem with the box, but you have a new problem because now you got kegs. So what do you do with your kegs? Well, it turns out the solution is build a kegerator, and uh, we actually um, did that to minimize bottling time. But I'll finish with telling you how why else it's pretty good. Um, so this is how it looks, a uh, second-hand fridge. This is actually not even a second-hand fridge. This is a fridge we found downstairs at <laughs> and uh, had to revive. And, um, uh, and then we painted it nice and black. 
And then uh, the only difference is there are two tabs coming out there. And if you open that device, it looks like this. So you have two kegs in there and a lot of plumbing. Again, you have these blue cables, our signature from Mr. Cables. <laughs> so, and then you see there's some, uh, uh, some tubing coming in where gas is let into the kegs. And then the beer is pushed out if you open the tap. So that is uh, actually how it works in the pub as well, um, except that we didn't buy something commercially. So you need a second-hand fridge. If you're lucky, you just find one <laughs> downstairs one day. Um, you can buy taps from the internet. They are quite cheap. You get tubing, and I kid you not, Singapore is one of the coolest places I know for buying tubing. Like at Kelantan Lane, there are shops which you can't imagine. They have everything. So that's, that's like, so that's always like when we are stressed at work, we get a couple of professors and postdocs and so on, and you just all go on a shopping trip, or you don't go any malls, you just go down to another lane. And then the last thing is the CO2 bottle, which you can basically get anywhere, with, which is like a diving equipment kind of thing. Okay, um, okay, so, and then I really recommend all of you to start brewing, and if you do that, invest into Kegerator, because it's immensely popular for hosting events. So we started inviting people, and everybody was already like, oh, so cool, you got the kegerator. Did you build it yourself? And we were like, yeah. And like, oh, you're like the big band theory, so cool. Uh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really, it's, it kind of en enhances your social status. So we were like, OK. <laughs> we, we, we thought we were a bit lazy, but we didn't want to bottle beer. But it turns out it's actually quite cool. And then uh, what we also figured out is now we have kegs and CO2 bottles, so it's in principle portable. And um, later on, at the after party, I brought two kegs and the CO2 bottle, so you can actually taste our, um, our beer. And we actually, these days, we have some events at work or, or barbecues, and we tend to bring just kegs. And, and that's also very nice, because you're always like, you know, if you're a physicist, you're kind of awkward at barbecues, lots of new people. And then, but then they see, oh, you brought beer. And they're like, mm, yeah. And then you can talk half an hour about beer, and then you have got new friends. So <laughs> very easy. <laughs> OK. Um, so the last project, and I'm running a bit out of time, but <laughs> I want to mention it because I, then I also have web sockets in my talk. So we have this project called Fluffy Brew, and it's basically completely useless, but we need a mascot because we want to have a cute rabbit who drinks beer. So if you have any artistic skills, yeah, or you know some <laughs> artistic skills, please uh, um, forward him or help to me, and we need a Fluffy or a beer drinking mascot. Anyway, so what is Fluffy Brew? Um, so when we so when I back off a little bit, when we had the Raspberry Pi, we thought, oh, dude, we must control our brewery with the Raspberry Pi. Like, why? It doesn't really matter. You just have to do that. <laughs> and, 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 and basically, we thought, oh, somebody must have done it. And so we forked it on GitHub. So um, this is this Raspberry Bruce software by Stephen Smith. But then we were like, damn, he doesn't use a, a pump. So we need a button to add a pump. And that, like, if you're a physicist and you have never done JavaScript, you're like, dude, how do I add a button? Yeah. <laughs> and then I, and I kid you not, it, it took us longer to add a button than to, to build all that stuff. <laughs> so then, then we were like, ah, jQuery. Huh? <laughs> so so, so we, we figured out what jQuery is, and then uh, we added a button. So we were like, yes, success. But then we were like, OK, now that we are jQuery wizards, because we know what jQuery is, we can do better ourselves. So, and, um, so basically, we always wanted to use Flask. Uh, don't know why, just it's kind of cute. <laughs> So it's a, it's a Python web framework. We have to currently serve it by Tornado because we use web sockets for our GUI. Nobody really knows why we do that. <laughs> but it, it might just be the thing to do. And uh, we have a lightweight client in jQuery, which is a euphemism for we avoid writing JavaScript as best as possible. And uh, the real reason is, uh, as a friend of mine was put it like, Dilemma support to smartphone, because he's like, why do you use your laptop to control your Raspberry Pi if you all have like iPhones and Androids in your And that would be actually kind of cool. So we are on our way, and we are overdoing it by heaps. But anyway, so if, if any, anybody's interested in, at the end of the talk, there's a GitHub link. So we, I pushed actually this morning, because I'm like going to a tech conference, so I have to have a GitHub. So I, I pushed all of that, um, and I tried to add readme's and stuff like that later. Um, anyway, so if you're interested in that, you can join us. And that's now that's solid you know, web development technology, so everybody in the room should be able to do that. All right, um, I want to end in my last two minutes with a few notes. So first, Homeo is a pretty vibrant community. There are even a couple of people that uh, brew or want to brew in the audience. And it's actually much bigger than the tech people. So also like food people, 
And then there's, we have one guy who basically cultivates yeast, which is pretty cool because you can get a lot of different yeast from it. But he has some biology background. And I'm, I mean, cultivate yeast in a controlled way. So he puts it on some heavy dishes inside fridges and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, and, and the other thing is, and I, I mean, I, I was joking throughout most of my talk, but you can hack as much as you want. And it's really nice because we, I mean, the limiting factor for us is really time and money, but there's so many project ideas out there. I mean, you add the touch control to your tabs, for example. I mean, just press a button and have some automated valve that, I mean, that would be cool. Or something like that. Have a proximity sensor that senses you and then dispenses your beer already. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it, you, you, so, that, so, so we want to do a lot of stuff, but we are a bit, uh, so we still have to finish our PhDs at some point. All right. Um, uh, so if you want to get started, uh, check out this website. It's very easy to get started and people are super friendly. This is run by a guy um, who brews for brewers and sells stuff that brewers use for brewing for a little bit extra, but it's very cheap. And um, there's even, I want to mention this, uh, SUTD, the new university, has a brewing club. So it's confirmed now the coolest uh, university in Singapore. And they've made it into Straits Times. I don't know how. But so <laughs> Straits Times story, uh, SUTD students beer, uh, brew beer. And I think there's even one in the audience. I saw him in, yeah, back there. <laughs> And yeah, and then uh, we have a monthly meetup because apparently you have to have that these days. And um, uh, so there are basically beer nets come together and you taste your beer, you talk beer, but it's also very good for newbies. So you can uh, ask questions, we get you started, we give you a technology transfer, basically, you know, this thing, we don't use it anymore, so we just give it somebody else and stuff like that. <laughs> um, it still works, yeah, it still works. So, um, okay, uh, uh, okay, so, as I said, lay down, you can enjoy the beer. So it's downstairs, you might have seen it in the fridge, two big kegs, and the fridges are amazing, they're at one degree, so it should be really nice. I want to thank a few people, and I, uh, I have to thank Nick, who's not here, because he's probably now drowned in beer already in KL, but he's actually the mastermind behind the beer. So, so all the taste and the different recipes and so on is done by Nick, so if you like our beer, you know, you know, think about Nick and it's okay, and if you don't like our beer, then I probably messed it up in transport, so I'm very sorry about that. And so both of us work at this place, the Center for Quantum Technologies, and if you have never heard about it, you should have here heard about it, because it's I think one of the coolest places at, at, at Singapore. And why is it cool? I'll show you in a few slides. But basically, at the beginning, we had a lot of help from a guy called Christian Kotzeter, who is a hacker slash maker slash full tenured professor at NUS. And we basically asked very timidly, can we use your laser driver displays? Can we use the PCB milling machine? And he's like, yeah, we just look the wrong, uh, the, the other way while you're doing it, and it's okay. So, uh, so we got a lot of uh, institutional support from these people. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I'm not kidding. Like uh, the, the spirit of and of the CQT so we are, is is really that we want to, you know, also connect with you people. So if you if you want to talk tech, if you want to even talk physics. If you're interested in what we're doing, just con contact us on this website. Uh, there are also non-nerdy, like general audience kind of articles. And it's easy to remember. It's quantum law because we're interested in quantum mechanics and law because we're in Singapore. <laughs> okay, so then, um, so we do a lot of outreach. So this guy is Christian Kortzipa. And this guy is Nick Luthi, and you see there's something with beards and physicists. <laughs> and this was at this year's uh, Maker Fair, so there's some laser electronics that we built and we showed off and explained some physics around it. And um, later on, uh, you will uh, have the chance to see this in action. So you see two kegs here and uh, some tubing, very portable. This is again a CQT. And this is Nick Luthi enjoying a cup of beer hidden in a Spinelli's coffee cup <laughs> uh, with a guy called Dave Weinland, who is a frequent visitor to our place and just happened to be last year's Nobel laureate in physics. So if a Nobel Prize winner enjoys our beer, I hope you will enjoy our beer as well. <laughs> All right, um, with that I stop slightly over time. Uh, these two people, Nick, again, and uh, Natasha, they have a blog called beerkenla.com, I think. And uh, as I said, since I'm on tech conference, I created this GitHub thing, also via Canva, where you find all the code. All right, uh, are there any questions? Hmm? Oh, yeah. So we have 10 minutes. I could call I have 30 minutes, so I'm now 33 minutes. But we have questions. Don't be shy. Yes, over there, back. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah, so, okay, so, uh, full disclaimer, I'm from Hamburg, so if somebody <laughs> calls me from Bavaria, that's kinda okay in Singapore, but if you do it in Germany, I would be upset. But uh, never mind, I like Oktoberfest a lot, and there are, Oktoberfest organizing it is, is a lot of effort, but at this homebrew club meetup, so these are all homebrewers, and we had some challenge, and this guy actually won, uh, anyway, and some other people also won, but we have next month, for Oktoberfest, at the meetup, we all brew an Oktoberfest beer, which is a particular style, so we have our little uh, Oktoberfest, so we already have it, it's just not, not very public, but we're definitely in the spirit there. Yes? Um, as far as I understand, the process of brewing beer is a kind of lengthy process. So it takes a few weeks from start to finish to get uh, a new brew. Is no, that correct? No. So uh, depending on how you brew, so you can. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, uh, so the question was uh, you understood that the, uh, the brewing beer part is a lengthy part, and it typically would take four weeks, and that's not oh. true. So the brewing day is usually a day, so it takes about five hours to, but then depending on how much effort you want to put in. So we put, uh, we put quite a bit of effort in, so it takes five hours, but you, if you skip a few steps and rely on commercial ingredients, then you can cut it down to two or three weeks, uh, two or three hours. And then fermentation is one week for ales and two weeks for lagers. And then lagers are called lagers because they are lagered, so they need to lager for <laughs> <laughs> for one more week, at least. So, um, yeah. <laughs> in German, they're not called Lager, so I, I was very surprised. It's a very good name for this beer. Anyway, so, um, uh, yeah, so basically, a Lager takes at least four to five weeks, and ale you can drink after one week. And that means most home brewers would typically drink ale, because a <laughs> bit less effort. And ale's are also easier to make. So, uh, with fermentation, uh, how much time would Take me, for example, from start to first sip of my beer. Yeah, so you, you, uh, clarify this question. So, how long does it take from start when you start brewing to the first sip of beer? And that's a week. Yeah. Uh, if you if you brew eggs. Okay. How do I debug my beer if I find a bug? Like okay. It tastes horrible. Okay. So the other question, which is a very good question, how do you debug your beer? And we have painful experience with that. <laughs> so we actually made a lot of beers who tasted like uh, cough medicine. <laughs> uh, and um, the best way, so you can kind of, some things are obvious, if it, smell, if it tastes burnt, you probably burn the grains, so that's obvious, but uh, if it uh, tastes like cough medicine, you're like not really good, and then we went to one of these meetups and said, oh damn, we had another batch that tested like cough medicine, and then one dude was like, oh, so you're using chlorine to sanitize your equipment, and we're like, yeah, why do you know? Well, that causes cough medicine <laughs> taste. So, so actually, there are, there are there's a brewing, there's a knowledge, a body of knowledge which people have, also online, where you can debug. And I kid you not, this guy came up with a spreadsheet, which he pulled out of somewhere, and you could have off tastes and then possible causes. And we were like, <laughs> that's, that's pretty useful. And more questions? Uh, please. Yeah, so uh, he asked whether on this relay transistor, he, he, um, the output, can he drive the uh, relay with the NPN transistor instead of a MOSFET? Yes, we just, uh, I used the MOSFET because I was lazy to put in the resistor for the NPN transistor, but you can use any transistor. So the relays are very uh, straightforward and they are not uh, stupidly high currents. So you can use a normal, what is it, 2 or something, and the entrance is and, and it, it, it will work perfectly. Okay, more questions? Okay, on the floor there. Ah, yeah, so I didn't explain that. So the carbonation, so um, as the yeast eats, uh, so the question was, how do we put the fermentation into the beer? So as the yeast eats the sugar and uh, turns it into alcohol, there's a byproduct of CO2. Now, usually the CO2 just goes away because uh, there's a air lock, so the, there's an air exchange somehow, but um, if you feed the yeast instead of with grainy sugar, uh, which is uh, maltose, if you feed it with dextrose, so normal sugar, um, then the yeast uh, only produces CO2 and then at some point dies. So if you want to get CO2 into your beer, you put the beer into a bottle, you put a little bit of sugar in it, normal sugar, and you wait for a week or so, 
then you have carbonation and the yeast is there. And so that's a bit of a painful exercise because sometimes you put too much sugar in, sometimes too little and so on. So what you also can do is if you have kegs and the CO2 bottles, you over pressure the keg with CO2 and then uh, the CO2 is dissolved into the beer. And that's basically how any uh, soft drink or beer is uh, carbonized conversion. Very good question. Other, other things? Yes, green shirt. So the question, or this, he started this uh, question with the statement that the most tedious part you had to find group is sanitation. Have you done anything to make it more efficient? I wholeheartedly agree that <laughs> the most tedious part is sanitation. However, if you do it right, it's quite, uh, you can make it controllable. So what we use is uh, iodine-based sanitation. So instead of using hot water or whatever, you use a, a, a chemical, which is basically iodine. More than iodine, but that, that very efficiently kills any germs. So you just literally, I mean, you, you first wipe it with uh, water, like warm water, and then you spray this iodine based solution. And once you've done that, you never have any infections anymore. Uh, that is the sanitation part. The other part, which is a bit tedious, is cleaning up. Especially in our home built equipment, we typically have very small pumps because they are quite cheap and stuff like that. So it's a bit more tedious to. But it's, as I said, everything is done in five hours. More questions? Yeah, at the back again. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So, so the question was that traditionally one uses barley to make beer. Have you tried using rice? Uh, question is yes. Have you tried using more crazy stuff? Yes. So we made a sweet potato beer, <laughs> um, which actually turned out quite nice. So you can, any starchy thing uh, usually works, but you have to have the right enzymes to break it into sugar. So rice on its own, it's very hard to do that. So what you typically you can add rice to barley, but even Japanese rice beers are not truly made out of rice. If you want to uh, break down rice, you have to go down the route of, say, Koreans, where they do makoli, but it basically makes sticky rice, lots of sticky rice, and then just let it uh, uh, let the yeast eat it like a complete rice. But then there's the, the, there's no um, enzyme step to break down the starches while making the sticky rice. That's why sticky rice is slightly uh, sweeter. Uh, more questions, please. I think there was a question about why yeast in your beer. Yeah, yeah, we have a little bit actually on our list to do that. So the suggestion was ladies' fingers, and we definitely want to do that. So it's, it's meant to be good. How consistently are you getting the same quality? Okay. okay, so the question is how consistently do we get the same quality? At the beginning, not very much. Now, more and more better. So the one thing is, uh, right now we, we are at the stage where we can design beers. So you can say you want to have this taste, this alcohol content, this blah, blah, this color. And there's actually software that helps you on this process. And you can do that. And if you don't screw up, you, uh, you get the same thing. Now, there are two limiting factors. One is the fermentation. So if the yeast works slightly different, you get slightly different taste. And that's usually where it goes wrong. But that's, say, the lightning hit your HDB and the fridge went off all day, then you get different taste. But if you, if you control it, it's a very repeatable process. OK, good. Then, uh, OK, so let's wrap it up. And if you have questions, you can find me later downstairs uh, with the two kegs of beer and just try it.